So it was a treble for William Buick yesterday. The first of those victories came on Well of Wisdom for Godolphin. And the horse had to survive a steward's inquiry, and William escaped a ban from the stewards who thought the in interference was accidental. As documented in your uh, report from Sandown today in the Racing Post, Lee, not everyone felt the same. No, it was um, a decision that surprised some people. These decisions, based on, on interference and in race taken by stewards, are always going to be subjective. You know, however, however tightly you write rules, they have to be interpreted by the people in the stewards' room at the time. A lot of people took the view that we're well, here at the two pole, Well of Wisdom is in the Godolphin Blue under William Buick, and you're looking at the horse next to him on the rail surf, Dancer ridden by Jason Watson. As they come inside the final furlong, around half a furlong from home, Well of Wisdom, with William riding the horse with his whip in the left hand, dives to the right and very badly hampers there Jason Watson on surf dance. You can argue that surf dance was lucky not to come down, simply looking that Jason Watson didn't come off the horse. Initially, there was a serious inquiry, and there was some debate about whether the winner would lose the race. Based on the rules, that was always very, very unlikely to happen. I think where the stewards have a fair point is that William gave the horse two smacks with his left hand. People are saying it's the incorrect hand, not necessarily because the horse was drifting that way. So he changed his whip to get him to straighten up, and that's been the result. So the stewards have said that's an accidental manoeuvre. Um, which he couldn't have avoided in the, yeah. in the timely fashion. I, I said to William yesterday, I said, I thought you were lucky to escape a ban. But George Baker, his ex Wangerham colleague, said, I don't think he'll get a ban. And he That's was right. right. And there's clearly a division of view on this one. Kevin Blake, the pundit for ITV Racing, he's been very strong on this issue. And he tweeted that, uh, you know, ha asking how people could find that sort of ride um, defensible. Um, and that, it, that they could cause accidents to horses and jockeys. It's very difficult. I, I, I do think when you look at it again and again, that one, it, the horse does suddenly dive to the right. Having kept straight, he does suddenly dive. So I can see why the stewards didn't ban him, although you can also see why they might have handed us a token two or three days, but they didn't. They didn't. And it's one of those sm smallish points, if you like, that could we could go on and talk about for half an hour, but that's the beauty of this programme. We're not allowed to. We have to move on. Um, owners. Uh, I want to talk about whether owners now should be let back onto a race course, whether there's enough space on a race course to be able to do it viably and safely, Lee. And, and are we approaching that time, do you think? I think we probably are approaching that time. Um, I think there's absolutely no doubt that when... Um, the next set of relaxations, if you like, of the, the numbers of people who can be on a race course, the owners are absolutely at the top of that list and they should be at the top of the list. But as things stand now, um, the BHA in Britain, Horse Racing Ireland, um, and jurisdictions all around the racing world have taken the view that if we're, if we're, if we're arguing that racing needs to take place for purposes of, of livelihoods and jobs and for entertaining the public, you, you only need essential people on a race course. And although owners are understandably hugely frustrated that they cannot go racing at the moment, I don't think you can argue that owners are essential to the staging of a... Uh, owners being on a race course are essential for the staging of a race meeting. And I think the vast majority of owners have been very understanding yeah. about that because I think it's really a toss-up. You either in these early days take the view that we could only stage race meetings if owners are allowed to be present. If that was the case, we're not going to be able to stage race meetings. Or you stage race meetings, owners have been paying so much money to support trainers and keep horses in training, thus making racing possible. For those horses to race, they have to sacrifice not being yeah. present on the race course. I think it's perfectly understandable. I think it's perfectly fair. It's happening all over the world. But that said, as soon as it is absolutely uh, safe and reasonable for owners to be on a race course, they should be on a race and course. And I think when a pub garden start being opened up and so yeah. forth, if you're using race courses as outside space, Absolutely. there is going to be possibly a case to be made that there's a bit more flex. I think where racing is going to have to be quite cute again is to separate its case as a place which is essentially a bit of parkland yeah. from a stadium. And of course, That's even, where it's got to be yeah. clever. And even when owners come back, it will need strict management. You know, yeah. Some paddocks, for example, are bigger than others. Mm. Could you have owners inside a parade ring? That might not be possible if you're having social distancing. Yeah. So even when it happens, it will be a different sort of experience for owners.
Let's talk about um, Philip Friedman's letter to the Racecourse Association this week. Philip Friedman is the chairman of the Horsemen's Group, the Racecourse Association um, boss. David Armstrong was the recipient of this letter. And this, Lee, is to do, <laughs> is to do with prize money. And uh, we, we thought that there was a, a ceasefire between racecourses and, um, and horsemen. The armistice is over, judged on this week. Yeah, with, without trying to, you know, be overly obsequious towards you, Nick. You wrote a very good column in the Racing Post. Well, thanks very much. That's all right, this week, in which you spoke about the peace that was taking place, but it wouldn't last forever, and you were spot on. Um, I, didn't, I didn't quite expect it to be a day later. No, no, but, out. you know, these things happen. Oh, yeah. um, so, Philip Friedman, the chairman of the Horseman's Group, horrible name, that, for a group, that needs changing. Um, the chairman of the Horseman's Group wrote to David Armstrong, chief executive of the Racecourse Association, in effect saying that the decision taken by the vast majority of racecourses, not all racecourses, but the vast majority of racecourses, to withdraw their executive contribution to prize money was an unlawful act based on collusion between racecourses. It's certainly possible to argue, I think, that as more income comes into racecourses, be that through increased media and betting rights, once betting shops open, from Monday um, through increased sponsorship levels, which I think have been greater than we expect, although we don't actually know how much bookmakers are paying for these race sponsorships, that racecourses should start funding exec contribution. But equally, I think if you look at racecourses at the moment, the vast majority of their income streams have dried up and they are in a difficult position. And John Gosden, who would you'll be interviewing later on in the, in the programme, has made the point that he fears that some racecourses could disappear at the end of this process. It's a very difficult situation. You would love to see harmony between all racing stakeholder groups at this particular time, yeah. but in racing that is seldom possible. Indeed, that's something we will monitor over the next few weeks. Uh, let's tip our hat to, to Gordon Lord Byron, who Tom Hogan and the owners so sadly lost this week. Horses are quite often described as legends warriors we bandy the terms around too liberally but this horse was a legend and he yeah. was a true true warrior with wonderful connections as well yeah i mean how could you not love a horse like gordon lord byron everything about his story was heartwarming and endearing you know you've got a horse who cost two thousand euro to buy you've got a horse who was pulled up um, on his debut um, at one of ireland's smallest tracks suffered a, a serious injury that kept him off the race course for ages. During his recovery, um, Tom had to put tyres in the horse's box so he wouldn't get down and further injure himself. He then took a small yard um, on a journey around the racing world. You see him here after winning the Haydock Sprint Cup, one of his Group 1 victories. He went to Australia and won the George Ryder Stakes. Yeah, beating which is pretty insane, to be honest. Well, it beating is, Australian yeah. sprinters. Well, that's it. You're no, beating you Australian sprinters on their home soil. Um, that was one of the great days, I think, for Irish racing internationally. You know, you, you had Dermot Weld, the pioneer, winning a, win a, win a Melbourne Cup, and then you have Tom Hogan winning a George Ryder with that horse. He was a most marvellous horse. At the age of 12, he still had an official rating in advance of 100. He was still enjoying racing as well. He was still bringing delight to Tom Hogan and all the horses fans. He was the most fabulous racehorse who was given the most fabulous career by by Tom Hogan. They perfectly suited each other. He adored the horse and even in death he was speaking of how well the horse had been and how excited he'd been about the horse's 12 year old season. It's, it's desperately sad um, but he leaves an awful lot of happy memories. And it's been pointed out by other commentators this week that every time you rang Tom Hogan the horse was always going better <laughs> than ever and his glass was always half full. It was absolutely tremendous. And, and what a horse, 1.9 million pounds he won. Um, let's raise a glass to the, the life and career of, of Gordon Lord Byron, who sadly we, we lost this week. Let's um, transition to a trainer who will no longer be uh, holding a license. Um, that's Lucy Normile, who's had a, a successful career training in Scotland. Um, and she's, she's drawn stumps. And, and I, I don't think she will be the last to do this in the next few months, Lee. No, I don't think she will. It's very sad, um, but it's not very surprising, um, as you say, Nick. Um, Lucy, when she was explaining her decision to retire, 
she made the basic point that she doesn't simply have enough horses anymore to make a training business sustainable. She did say that the, the coronavirus had had an impact on that. That can have an impact in two ways. One, in the sense that owners for whom spending money on racehorses is a luxury it's a luxury spend, isn't it? You don't need to have a racehorse. You can only do it if you can afford to have mm. a racehorse. A lot of people can't afford it anymore. But also a lot of horses have been taken out of training uh, to make uh, it cheaper for, for owners, perfectly understandably. Lucy couldn't maintain the business. I think realistically, you have to say that this is going to happen more and more often. And it's not just a racing thing. There will be businesses across so many sectors in this country and in other countries that will fall by the wayside simply because the economics of it don't add up at the moment. We are going to see it in racing, but I don't think we should necessarily see it as a purely a racing issue. I say businesses are being hit all over. And it's also the case that I think if you said to people, you know, this is a, this is a trainer with not many horses who is maybe having one or two winners a year, it's not necessarily surprising that that sort of business mm. is hard to maintain. There will always be businesses that fall by the wayside in any sector, in any economic period. Right now, that's going to happen even more often. Yeah, we wish, uh, we wish Lucy well, Lucy Normile, who has announced her retirement this week. Uh, Anna-Marie Phelps, the chair of the British Horse Racing Authority, has written an excellent column in this morning's Racing Post to um, really rally the troops, I think, Lee. Yeah. It's quite an inspiring you know, let's push forward, Colin, but also very much stressing racing's need to underline, uh, re-emphasise its commitment to diversity as it, as it rebuilds out of the pandemic. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think Anna-Marie Phelps, in what is still a relatively short time as, as BHA chair, has been extremely impressive. I think she is a unifying force within the sport. She's someone who comes into it not from a racing background, but that's not necessarily... A bad thing in a job like that and I think in this Racing Post column today as you say she, she, she makes she says the right things in the right way and she does as you say um, more than touch she expands on the diversity question that is facing every sector at the moment we've all seen the news we've all seen the the horrific things that have happened in America with with the killing of George Floyd and another um, death um, we read about this morning in the news in America, we've seen the, the protests and the rights that have taken place in many countries. Diversity and inclusion are big issues for, for everyone at the moment and it is absolutely right that the, the BHA and racing thinks hard about this. It is absolutely clear that among racing's race, race rate workforce, it is a very diverse mm. workforce but sadly in racing's boardrooms, in racing's customer groups, that is not the case. And it is right that racing, for both moral and commercial reasons, seeks to make itself as attractive as possible to as many people as possible. Some in the sport don't like that. They think it's diverting attention from other matters. It's not. It's a hugely important issue for racing and for all industries, and it's right that racing is looking at it. Yes, I think it, it, it's... It's realising that this isn't a separated segment of yeah. your policy. It's not, it, it, it has to be in, in every part of your policy. Absolutely right. It's not a token, fluffy, box-ticking thing. It is imperative yeah. for racing as a business. Um, the final talking point is Terra Bellum, who, you know, on the face of it, is just the second favourite for the Queen Anne stakes at Royal Ascot. But she brings with her uh, sort of extra layers of significance. The first of those, Lee, is to do with her jockey, and the second of those is to do with her ownership. Yeah. One is slightly more straightforward to talk about than the other. The, the jockey situation is that when she won at Newmarket... Mm. Um, the Daily Stakes. Week, the Daily yeah. Stakes. It was the first time that Frankie Dottori had widden, ridden a winner in the Godolphin Silk since 2012. It was also, um, this year, is the first time he's been riding in the Godolphin Silks since 2012. We all know the story of Frankie's split from Godolphin, um, and we all know that it was very difficult at the time, but last year in particular, Frankie started riding more and more horses for members of Sheikh Mohammed's family. He won the Queen Mary Stakes for Sheikh Mohammed's son, Sheikh Hamdan. 
However, he wasn't riding horses in Godolphin silks, even those trained by John Gosden. That has changed now. I spoke to John for a Racing Post interview uh, in today's edition. There wasn't room for everything, including his comments on this one. But he talked about it as a natural progression, and it's good to see Frankie back in those yeah. silks. It is very good to see Frankie back in those silks, and she's a terrific filly, and I think she's got a pretty good chance as well in the Queen Anne. As far as the ownership is concerned, she was a Princess Hire horse, she was a Godolphin horse, she was a Princess Hire horse, she was a Godolphin horse. Uh, clearly, we know that this uh, court battle has been going on for some time. We've spoken about it on the programme before. Um, I'm not sure there's an awful lot... I mean, it's in the Sunday Times today on page three. I'm not sure there's an awful lot horse racing can can get involved with here in terms of the the the, the admin of the ownership. No, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a very high-profile case, but, you know, you made the point off-air before we started that, you know, if, if two people are married and then they c cease to be married, the BHA isn't going to look at every transfer of ownership, uh, every transfer of ownership case. There are clearly wider issues here, and they are very difficult for racing figures to talk about. Um, I understand why people are frustrated that people aren't more keen to talk about the, the Sheikh Mohammed issue. It's been a very high profile story. On the one hand, that issue and other issues raise the, the, the question of fit and proper person test for ownership. And that has been spoken about with, with yeah. other people. And it's right that questions are asked, e even if the answers aren't what people would want. But there is also the undeniable factor that there are thousands of jobs at risk, potentially that are linked to one person and it is therefore very difficult for the BH, I think as a governing body and senior figures in racing to say too much because they are frightened that those jobs might disappear. Well, they can only administer what's in their remit. And Absolutely, yeah. I'm not sure there's an awful lot they can do about what my learned friends are deciding about the horse's ownerships and, and, and so forth. Those were this week's Talking Points. on Sunday. Proudly sponsored by Albasti at Cruel Dubai.